Hello, Brittany Jackson here today to focus on the very non-scary universal design for learning, specifically the action and expression aspects of UDL. This presentation is from one of three UDL workshops offered to Hiram College faculty in the spring of 2018, where I presented on each of the three tenets of UDL, action and expression, representation, and engagement. This particular presentation focuses on action and expression. So what is UDL? According to the Center for Applied Special Technology, or CAS, UDL is a research-based set of principles to guide the design of learning environments and are, that are accessible and effective for all. So UDL began in the 1990s and is based on the original model of universal design that focused specifically on physical accessibility, more specifically for those with mobility challenges. But UDL focuses more on the educational environment and how to make every learning opportunity in your classroom accessible to your students, regardless of the differences they may have from each other. So there are three tenets of UDL, action and expression, which we are going to focus on in this presentation, representation, and engagement. So the image depicted here of a young man jumping and twisting and celebrating really seemed to represent both action and expression to me. So there are three guidelines for action and expression, physical action, expression and communication, and executive functions. And we will discuss all three in this presentation. So physical action. The image on this slide of a punching bag at a gym makes me feel like I'm about to do a physical action. But what does that mean from a UDL standpoint? The most important thing to remember is to provide materials that all learners can interact with. All materials need to be accessible, either by text-to-speech software, captioning, alternative text, and so on. Students should be given multiple means to show they know the content. Instead of providing students with only one type of assignment, such as a written paper, perhaps provide them the written paper, a video presentation, or an audio presentation. This provides students a variety of outlets and allows them to find the one they are most comfortable with. Many times, you can make your rubric with slight tweaks to fit all three scenarios. And what are you doing in class? Is there anything physical happening? If so, would a student with limited mobility be able to participate? If not, then you need to rethink that, that project or assignment. If you want students to take notes in your class, think about alternatives to writing with a pen and pencil. Some students may not be able to physically do that, but could type or use a mouse to click and take notes. Could the student talk with you to demonstrate they understand the material instead of writing a paper? Always be thinking about options and alternatives for people of all abilities, and then pro by providing a myriad of ways to demonstrate their knowledge, you're more likely to have provided an option to every student. So the image on this slide is of various tools, such as a hammer, nail, saw, measuring tape, and drill. And this is to remind us that the tools we provide our students are important. There should be no barrier to accessing the course materials for your students. Everything should be accessible. Are there keyboard commands that can replace the need to use a mouse? Do the students know these commands? If not, teach them. The nice thing at Hiram is we now have the use of the iPads, and that opens up a whole new world of possibilities when it comes to being more accessible. And always remember to think about your software choices if you require certain software. Is that particular software accessible in a variety of ways? If not, it may not be the right one to use. Expression and communication. So this goes both ways, from student to teacher and from teacher to student. So can students choose from a variety of assignments to demonstrate their knowledge for you, such as a recorded presentation, a written paper, a creative assignment, etc.? And do you provide other alternatives in how you communicate the concept in class? such as providing a physical 3D model to demonstrate a math or chemistry problem. That would help someone with, a, with visual issues. And you want to reach the students where they're at. The image on this page looks like Facebook connections with each avatar or profile representing one of us and our many online connections through Facebook or other social media sites. Most of our students are very tech savvy and comfortable with social media and can navigate most online tools. So maybe allow them to show you what they know in these medi mediums create, create, uh, creatively. Maybe an animation or comic strip might demonstrate the concept. Allow students the option to be creative. 
If you sound like a broken record when you're explaining a concept, you're only repeating the information the exact same way every time, and that's not going to work. Consider talking through it verbally and then showing it visually and then provide a physical demonstration because then that will provide the students a variety of ways to explore the topic. And teach the students how to use the tools on their iPads. While I just said they were tech savvy, that doesn't mean that they know all the back-end tricks or the best apps to accomplish the task they need to. Make sure whatever you use um, and show can work with text-to-speech software. This is tricky, especially with PDFs, so be careful. This photo of a spider web fits this slide so well. Um, consider using story webs or outlines to map out concepts. Then it becomes a visual tool for their toolkit. And I can't stress enough the importance of having something physical to represent the topic, be it blocks, models, creating something out of Play-Doh, etc. Be allow your students to be creative. And don't be afraid of the internet. There's a wealth of information there in the forms of wikis and animations, etc. So just be careful if you use a video, it's captioned well so students can access it. And then provide a variety of models to demonstrate an outcome. So if you're showing students addition, write the problem on the board. That's one way to demonstrate it. Another way is to use words, so 2 plus 2 equals 4. A third way is to use blocks to show the class that two blocks plus two blocks equals four blocks. Multiple ways for the students to grasp and understand this material is crucial. And then when choosing your TA, also be sure they feel comfortable and can explain the concepts in a variety of ways too, because students will probably turn to them first before coming to you. And you've probably heard the word scaffold in every UDL presentation I have done. It's may seem like common sense, but we often think students will know how to make the jump from one concept to another, but that isn't always the case. So help guide them and help them make that jump. Remember that your students are individuals and provide them feedback based on each of their needs, not the needs of the whole group. And always find ways for your students to connect to the real world and or their future careers. This ties nicely to the photo on this slide of doors opening to the world outside. So executive functions. Um, UDL framework suggests increasing executive functioning skills in two ways. The first by, yet again, scaffolding the lower level skills so that they require less executive processing. And then two, scaffolding higher level executive skills and strategies so they're more effective and developed. So the photo of a person marking a check mark in a box reminds us to give students a guide or checklist of what to expect to learn or the steps needed to do XYZ. By posting goals and objectives and or schedules, as well as an estimate of time, energy, resources, and difficulty, you're giving the student the reins to their learning, so they're in charge. Uh, these things can be in your syllabus and in Moodle, but you want to make sure that you provide multiple ways for students to get it. And again, I'm going to say it again, scaffold and build upon previous known situations but also provide models or examples of the topic you want them to master. You also need to provide opportunities for your students to think and reflect about what you're talking about before they have to jump into tackling the problem. So provide opportunities for students to show their work and explain it to you. And have TAs uh, or mentors talk through the problem or break the larger problem into smaller, more manageable goals. This is just like if you're starting an exercise regimen. If you set the bar too high for yourself, i.e. I'm going to work out every single day for one hour, and within a day or two you begin to slip because it was probably unattainable in the first place, you're more likely to give up. But if you set manageable goals, for example, I'm going to work out two days a week for an hour each time, that's more manageable and you're more likely to reach the end goal. Same goes with your students and the course content. Provide a guide for your students, either a study guide or research uh, a checklist or ideas on note taking, and have your students reflect regularly on how much they're contributing to class. Show your students their progress. Uh, maybe it's a culmination of all the projects due for the course, um, because this will let them see where they started and where they've made it to. 
and this ties nicely to the image on the slide of a man standing at the highest bar of a bar graph. He can look back and see his progress. And always remind students that they can ask questions. This seems straightforward, but students often don't feel comfortable asking questions because they're afraid of looking dumb. And if you can find ways for students to ask questions in a less public manner, that might ease some of that anxiety, but be sure to let students know that you're there to help them and you're willing to answer those questions. Remind them more than just the first class period. Remind them every class period. And then always have a rubric and it's recommended to also have a form of peer and self-assessment built into your course. That way students again are self-reflecting and they can see how far they've grown. And this is an image of many useful apps for universal design for learning, and this one specifically focuses on the means of action and expression. So this document with clickable links to the apps will be available in the UDL module in the Feather Fellows Moodle site. And as always, if you have questions about UDL, you can reach out to me at jacksonb1 at hiram.edu or extension 5380, or you can contact Lisa Veronis um, at veronisem at hiram.edu or extension 6114. I hope this has helped you and please check out the other presentations about UDL to assist you. And remember, if you're confused or having trouble accessing it, your students will too.